Welcome back to the programme. It's just gone half past seven, 7.32 in fact. It's Paul and Rosie live with you this morning until 10 o'clock. And let's have a quick look at the day's front pages. Starting with the Times, which says plans being drawn up to keep supermarket shelves stocked during a possible rail strike, which could be the biggest in modern history. The Guardian reports that police chiefs will apologise for racism, discrimination and bias within their forces in a new plan that they're going to lay out on Tuesday. The Daily Express leads with the uh, royal family allegedly secretly housing Ukrainian refugees. The Daily Star are criticising Rishi Sunak for being named as the 222nd richest person in Britain. Let's go through what's inside the papers now. Joining us this morning is political editor of uh, HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield, and journalist Ella Whelan. Good morning to both of you. Um, Ella, if I could start with you. Um, this, this is a great story about smoking. Yes, on the front page. Are there any great stories about smoking? When I say great, I mean it's an interesting story about smoking. <laughs> well, it depends whether you think smoking is... Uh, whether you're a smoker, whether you think smoking's great or not. Well, this is true, yeah. Um, so, uh, Sajid, Sajid Javid is, has uh, commissioned a investigation, a kind of report into looking at what can be done to lower smoking rates. Um, and the suggestion is that one of the potential outcomes that could come from that is a change in the uh, law around the age limit of smoking. So instead of you having to be 18 to buy a pack of cigarettes, you might have to be 21, wait until you're 21 to do that. And that's in the hopes of uh, bringing the rates of smoking to less than 5% by 2030. Now, there has been, you know, over the years, there's been so much to do with trying to lower smoking rates. We know that statistically, looking at all the data, the biggest effect on people stopping smoking has been the introduction of vaping and people's ability to switch over to vaping and use that. And then eventually they get they either stay on vaping or they get off that altogether. Um, we know that the kind of restrictive measures, whether it be, you know, banning them uh, with the smoking ban indoors or raising prices or sticking them those horrible pictures on the front of fag boxes has had an effect in terms of we know that coercion tends to have an effect um but the you know this suggestion really irks me not least as someone who used to be a someone who very much enjoyed a cigarette mm. um before i was pregnant uh you know but it's a, it's you know the legal age limit for adults in this country is 18 and uh you know if you wanted to review the whole shebang and say that drinking and smoking and and sex and marriage and everything gets raised because we're going to change what we understand to be an adult, then that would be one argument. But this clamp down on smokers' rights, essentially, I think, just is something that most people should care about, even if you think that, uh, that most people do, that smoking is bad for your health. <laughs> it's saying that people need to be micromanaged and you know the telegraph here reports on one of the anti-smoking campaign is disparagingly saying <clears throat> you know the Tories won't do anything because they see you know they get called kind of this gets called nanny statism when it gets brought in mm. but, I mean, it's very hard to it's very hard to describe it as anything else other than you know at the point at which the NHS were constantly being told hasn't got enough cash for you know an extra few GPs that it's um, completely in disarray that it doesn't have the resources it needs to do. Sajid Javid is busting a load of money on an investigation around smoking, which they've called, um, someone has called radical. It would be quite radical mm. if we said to the population at large, you've got to be 21 before you can buy a cigarette. Well, yeah, absolutely, it would be. Is it, is it New Zealand that have, is bringing in a law basically where uh, once you pass a certain age, um, you can't buy cigarettes at all? Mm. Uh, so they're looking to phase it out entirely. People born after, I can't determine what you what year it is so compared to that this is actually a, a minor reform but yeah it is it would be uh, pretty radical and as, as Ella said it would be a bit of an infringement on people if you enjoy a cigarette and you can't have one legally anyway until you're 21 I just wonder whether it may actually become counterproductive because it becomes such a taboo amongst young people you know what is this thing that you can do to your 21 it must be great yeah then it makes yeah, you yeah, yeah, the reverse fall. psychology it has yeah. fallen out of fashion a bit hasn't it well that, that's true i mean maybe they are, they are pushing it an open door you know as ella says you know vaping is much more uh, popular now uh, over the last well, several years rates of mm. smoking have decreased 
but clearly the government wants to go even further. Let's talk about something that definitely is popular, football. The end of the season is nigh. Emotions are high. Mm. But what we're seeing is some really ugly behaviour from fans. Why do you think that is? And what should be done to try and clamp down on it? Well, I mean, it's quite unusual. I mean, pitch invasions have always happened um whether it's your team's won the league or they've qualified for the champions league or they've avoided relegation whatever i think what's different about it now is this um goading of opposition players and managers this seems to be a completely new thing i wonder whether social media is playing part of it because you had the the incident with patrick vieira the other night at goodison mm -hmm. park now not only did this young guy think it was a good idea to confront Patrick Vera, which I think is a pretty bad idea because he's a really big guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but he also filmed it. Um, and the video has been posted online since then as well. And I just think it's just... Uh, I don't know if it's a fad. Some people have called fashion. it like carnival culture. Yeah, and I think maybe part of it as well is because of lockdown. You know, the fans weren't allowed in the, in the stadium for a year and, you know, there's a, a bit of like a pent-up... I mean, if you're being kind, you know, it's a pent-up exuberance, but I think it's completely unacceptable. Now, what you do about it is a much more difficult question because we certainly don't want to go back to the pre-Hillsborough days or the pre-Taylor Report days of um, fans being treated like cattle, essentially, and being caged into terraces, which was obviously dangerous, incredibly dangerous. But um, something needs to be done. Uh, now, there are there's other types of barriers which aren't like like vertigo but they're horizontal so it's more mm. difficult to, to mm. climb over that slows them down gives the stewards an opportunity to, mm. to stop moving on the pitch but ultimately if you've got tens of thousands of young men in the main who want to go on a, a pitch the stewards aren't, aren't going to stop them so it has become a, a cultural change and maybe a few swinging bands um, you know lifetime some bands some points to that yeah indeed well. that, that, that's what you might, think might make fans think twice yeah and we're going to go through some of your views in just a moment GB views at uh, gbnews.uk uh, if you want to get in touch with us on that one and also on Jamie Oliver which is something you want to talk about Ella uh, that's in the Times today he was outside Downing Street yesterday yeah. waving a dessert around I've got a, kind of a theme going here haven't I about um, like kind of intervention to people's private lives very good secret picture of Jamie Oliver on the front page of the Times there um, he's had long term, long term had a bee in his bonnet over um, poor people eating crappy food, or, or more accurately, poor people eating the food that they want to eat. Uh, and so his campaign is to clamp down. He wants the government, which they had previously did have plans, and were entertaining the idea of stopping buy one get one free or buy two for one deals on junk food uh, and kind of bringing in laws around advertising to stop the advertising of food that was bad for you before nine o'clock, kind of doing a won't somebody think of the children line. And, you know, I think nothing script. He's he, he held up an eaten mess and said, what an eaten mess. Ha ha ha, Boris Johnson eating, you get it. Yeah. Um, and nothing screams, I'm not an Etonian, I'm really in touch with the rest of you, like trying to uh, eliminate food deals at a time of cost of living crisis when people are looking for um, cheaper options to put food on the table. It's just, it's, the, I mean, it's, Jamie Oliver just sack his PR team because there's terrible optics. But also this is a man who has made his uh, life off of, you know, recipes, which are what, I love Jamie Oliver's recipes. He's such a good cook. I, you know, look him up all the time online. You know, trifles and things like that that are full of sugar. He wants us to buy his books and for us, him to tell us what to eat. But he doesn't want us to be able to make those decisions themselves. And there's this really stupid kind of... Uh, moralizing around junk food everybody knows that if you had if you have five twixes for dinner instead of you know meat and two veg that probably that's not great for your health but most people are not doing that and sort of suggesting that um people on the lower end of the income spectrum which, you know, poor people um who he's really targeting need to be told by uh, let's face it kind of as he ages as an increasingly plump jamie oliver <laughs> that, that you know what to Ooh, eat right in the right there you go yeah guy. yeah really i think like most people you, really do, like you were just praising his recipe. He's a fantastic cook. I hate you, Jamie, but that is a wonderful Stick lasagna. Stick to the yeah. kitchen. Stop telling me what to eat. <laughs> what strategies would work to help us eat cleaner, eat healthier? I, d I don't think there needs to be a kind of a, a, you know, a strategy in terms of policing what people eat. If we want to look at obesity, you know, which is which is a, a problem, and you know, I'm all for getting people to be able to eat healthy. You know, how much is a gym membership these days? You know, how how many um, basketball courts and football arenas has have been closed down in local communities? There is all options for giving people more choice, giving people more, you know, free. You want to see a drive?
towards exercise, more exercise. No, I don't want to be whipped around a, a you know, a football oh, field. Oh, not like whipped, but just, either. yeah, no, no. <laughs> what do you think about calories on menus? Because they've been in place for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, that, I mean, there's a story actually throughout the papers which suggests that restaurants have been reporting that the novelty of calories on menus has had very little effect at all. Because most people, when they, most people, A, don't go out to eat every night. And when they do go out to eat, it's a treat. And they want to have the carbonara and not mm. the salad because you're having a good time. Do you Can I think... Just, I was just going to say, no, just being devil's advocate, like, when you were talking about the calories on the menus, I used to drink mockers. And when they did put on the menu how much was in a mocha, and it was about the same as a, <gasps> as a slice of pizza, I was thinking, I'm, I'm having like five five slices of pizza but every day. did you really not think hot chocolate wasn't bad for you? I, mean, I think most... I'm a simple man. I, I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't know it was so calorific. So I, I, did, I did change and I'm just saying, it's only my, you know, from my experience that you do then think, oh, actually, well, if that's the same as a slice of pizza, maybe I'll have a different kind of There's coffee. There's nothing wrong with information, so, yeah. but I think if this isn't just about information. This is about trying to get people to change their behaviours in ways they don't want to do. Yeah. One way you could change your behaviour, if you can get yourself up the waiting list, mm, yeah. grow your own, tell us more. Well, yeah, so allotments, I think during lockdown as well, uh, allotments were seen as, as, a, as a good way, if you had one, you know, to, to get out uh, in the fresh air, socially distanced. Um, and, yeah, this has been a trend for quite a while now, I think, uh, that the number of people on waiting lists for allotments has gone up um, quite considerably. So about 120,000 are registered for local authority plot, which is up from 90,000 in 2018. However, if you're thinking about reading this story and thinking, I'll, I'll stick my name down, um, you're now looking at up to 18 years. What? Uh, in some parts. <laughs> in, in Camden in North London, it can take 18 years due to high demand. So if you put your name down now, well, you'll be retired, I suppose. Which is actually, we, we're fortunate enough where we live, there's an allotment back on our back garden, and the allotment there is the best one, actually. It's beautifully maintained, but it's a couple who live across the road from us who are retired, and it's a full-time job. They're there from morning till night, and unless you're you know, willing to put in the hours, yeah. it's a hell of a commitment. And that's the other thing I, I know as well, that if you have an allotment and you don't look after it, those around about you yeah. very... Well, same as a garden, really, isn't it? Well, I yeah. suppose, yeah, but you know, if you've you know, waited for such a long time, um, put your name down, and the council have approved you, and you've got your allotment, and you don't then put in the hours to maintain it, the other allotment holders are pretty quick to... Yeah, yeah, well, it sounds like yeah. if you're waiting 18 years, they probably should be. Mm -hmm. Kevin, thank you very much. Ella, thank you to you as well. They'll be joining us again in about an hour's time, and we'll be looking at how the ongoing wagger for Christie saga, how that might change our use of social media in the recent libel cases, and also uh, Rishi Sunak being bumped up to 222nd on the rich list. More of that to come. <laughs> Lots of you have been getting in touch there about a story we were just mentioning about the behaviour of football fans, the optics that that gives. And a very good morning to you, Susan, who says, Pitch invasion's got nothing to do with lockdown invading the pitch. It's happened for decades, mainly at the end of the season. It represents, rightly or wrongly, fans expressing their joy at not being relegated, being promoted or showing love for their club. Yeah, John says pitch invasions have been legal for many years. Fines don't work. Point deductions do, but though there must be point deductions for all leagues in England and Wales. Uh, and just very finally, uh, it is International Tea Day today. We're going to be talking about that later on. Graham says, forget tea, it's World Whiskey Day today. The water of life, he says. Do you like whiskey? Not hugely, particularly not a Saturday morning. No, I went, to, I went to Scotland some time ago, and I know uh, you're still here, Kevin. Uh, I went to Scotland some time ago, and I mentioned that I don't like whiskey. <laughs> I was uh, scowled at. Well, it's worse being Scottish and not liking whiskey like me, so uh, I'm like a national, like a national traitor. <laughs> that was a, a big confession. Thank you very much for your candour.